Double Dare. <laughs> Well, last time, Rocky Bullwinkle and the Ruby Yacht were marched out of Frostbite Falls under armed guard. We take you back to remote city in Pakistan for terrible sweet punishment. Couldn't you just give us two demerits and let it go with that? Silence! Uh, As might be expected, the citizens of Frostbite Falls quickly summoned help. Well, Sergeant, what do you and your men suggest? I think we better call the police. Not only the local law enforcement agencies, but the federal as well were called in to block any attempts at fleeing the country. Sir, there are 60 young girls here who claim they're supposed to swim in the Olympics. 60, eh? Hold them for questioning. What kind of questioning? Telephone numbers, you know. What about the moose, the squirrel, the grand vizier? Let them get their own girls. Meanwhile, at Pier 62, the SS Plankton pulled away from the wharf. Captain, the Customs Bureau searched the ship and found nothing suspicious. Excellent. Oh, by the way, tell the engineer to oil those engines. Terrible racket. But the engines weren't responsible. The blame lay with Guy Vizier and his tremulous troubadours. From the beautiful rumpus room of the good ship Plankton overlooking the blue specific in the heart of downtown Jersey City, it's the captivating melodies of the makes you want to wretch music man himself. Yours truly is no one else. Guy Vizier with a sparkling, scintillating half minutes of toe-tapping harmonies coming to you indirectly from the locker room of the SS Andrea Doria. Just a short drive from Pier 86 atop the penthouse showroom in East Side, West Side. Here now is number one singer, gorgeous Georgia Peach, who asked the musical question, Tippy Tippy Tim? Bullwinkle, we gotta jump overboard before we're too far out to sea. Not yet, Rock. I got an arrangement coming up in the next set. Look, if you're worried about the chains on your legs, don't. Well, I must admit, they did cross my mind. Ah, but Rocky uh... had a plan. Sure enough, during his bass solo in Four Brothers, the resourceful squirrel attached a hacksaw to his bow, and by bar 32 had sawed through their fetters. You can imagine the vizier's surprise when at the start of a five-minute break, Rocky and Bullwinkle dashed from the room. Quick, the dogs are escaping. Shuttleboard games, sun deck bathing, all were shattered by the ensuing wild chase. Hey, what's going on here? Somebody requested running wild, and two of my boys took it literally. There we go. The pursuit lasted well into the wee hours of the night. They got to be somewhere on this tub. Oh, well, we pick up chase at dawn. Phew, lucky for us, they didn't look in this lifeboat. Yeah, we sure are lucky. A questionable statement for the engine room was having trouble maintaining full speed. As I understand it, the ship is overloaded. We must either jettison the lifeboat or the passenger. What do you suggest? Don't ask me, sir. Why not flip for it? Heads, passengers, tails, lifeboat. It came up tails, and wouldn't you know, the lifeboat to be sacrificed was the very one our lads were in. He seems to be getting a trifle heavy, Rook. Ah, it's probably a minor squall. Get some sleep. Careful there, men. You don't want it to land in the water upside down, do you? What's it matter? There's nobody in it. But, George, you're right. Throw it over. He seems to be getting a trifle heavy, Rook. You said that. Oh, we may be on the brink of a terrible tragedy. Only way to find out is to join us next time for The Deep Six or It's Tough to Fathom. <laughs> Once upon a time, there was a beautiful, beautiful queen. Flatterer. She was lovely, but the wickedest woman in the world. A fiend in human form. Well, nobody's perfect. Each morning, she would go to her mirror for advice. It was a very special mirror. It gave not only advice, but also music, news, the weather and stock reports. Amalgamated dragon, orphan eighth. 
Fairy Godmother Common, upper quarter. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is fairest of them all? The fairest of them all is Snow White. Snow White? Oh, that is disappointing. Now I'll have to do away with her. And the Queen went to the office of the Witch Pack Company, of which she was the owner. Let's see now. Witch Pack Poison Prunes. Which pack poison strawberries? Which pack sleeping death apples? That's it! I'll give her the 495 apple assortment. <laughs> but at that very moment, Snow White was hard at work in her office. Consolidated Dwarf, Snow White speaking. Right. 27 Dwarfs North Pole. Right away. Thank you, Mr. Claus. All right, you. Let's try it again. Way down upon the Swanee River. Uh, I just can't do it, boss. I'm not a child star. I'm a dwarf. Yeah, but child stars make a fortune. Look, I'm 47 years old. I got a wife and three kids in Kansas City. With those curls, who's gonna know? Get to the studio right away. Okay, boss. And don't forget to shave. Come in. Seems I can hardly keep the little beggars in stock these days. Excuse me, are you Snow White? Right, how many do you want? How many what? Dwarfs, of course. Let's see, 27 to the North Pole, at least seven. Seven dwarfs is all I have left. I don't want any dwarfs. Well, we discontinued our giant line, you know. Too much overhead. No, I just dropped you a little gift from the Witch Pack Company. Apples, my, they are tasty. Yes, eat one and you'll just die for more. <laughs> Well, if you ship prepaid, I'll take... Now we'll see who's fairest of them all. And the queen dashed off, leaving Snow White in a state of sleeping death. Mirror, mirror on the wall, who is fairest of them all? Don't you want the word on local news? No. How about the weather, your favorite waltz? Come on, come on now, who's the fairest? Like I told you, Snow White. What? But you're the prettiest. But you just said... I said Snow White was the fairest. She never lies, cheats, or steals. Now, what could be fairer than that? Oh, my. I've made a terrible mistake. And now, the latest in stock market quotations. Minnesota mowed down. Mm -hmm. Drawbridge Company up. Uh -huh. Consolidated Dwarf. Yes, yes. Down 500 points. 500 points! Then I'm wiped out. I'm destroyed. Yes. By putting Snow White to sleep, the wicked queen had ruined a company in which she was the major stockholder. All because I used witchcraft. Well, I'll never use it again. Never, never, never! And with that, the queen got rid of her entire stock. Now to wake up Snow White and get Consolidated Dwarf back on its feet. Let's see. Powdered bath toenails. Two cups spider venom. No, no more witchcraft. For those who have sworn off witchcraft, get one prince to kiss the victim. A prince! That's it! In a few moments, the queen was in the prince's chambers. Kiss a victim of sleeping death. Hmm. Well, let's see what the rate is. Rate? Oh, well, yes. You see, we charming princes have to make a living, you know. Let's see. That'll be two million gold grickles. Too much. Well, I can hold her hand for one million. No, you have to kiss her. Then it's two million. Take it or leave it. I'll take it. Wait, wait I'll get my bag. These house calls are such a nuisance. In a little while, the prince was at Snow White's door. Uh, where's the lady of the house, my little man? Over there. I won't be a minute. What kept you? I've been lying here for hours. Cool it. She fell for it. We're rich. Oh, where am I? Hooray! Now my stock will go up. Thanks ever so, Your Highness. It was nothing. Nothing? Well, ta-ta, I've got to go hear the ball game on my mirror. <laughs> <laughs> well, here comes the happy ending. The Queen was a better woman for having given up witchcraft, Consolidated Dwarf was back in business, and the Prince and Snow White were rich. Let's see the money, honey. Oh, well, there isn't any. I used it to make a sensational deal. Like what? I bought 5,000 shares of a new company called Witchpack. Here, have some apricots. I just ate all the apples. <laughs> To the game? Game? I almost forgot. Thanks. But I wanted more Kellogg's Double Dip Crunch. Oh, well. There's always tomorrow. Tomorrow? Wait 24 hours for more of that doubly nutty, frosted, six-sided sweetness? No way. I can't wait. 
It's amazing what people will do for one more irresistible bite of that doubly sweet, doubly frosted taste. Kellogg's Double Dip Crunch, part of this complete breakfast that's too good to go without. Sweet. You cast them aside, exiled to the closet. You thought the challenge was gone. You were wrong. Rescue them. Get your old video games out of the closet and play them like new with Game Genie. Game Genie lets you change levels, jump higher, punch harder, live forever. Uncover the new power in most of your old video games with Game Genie. Excellent! <laughs> For your Nintendo Entertainment System, Game Genie from Galoob. Hello again, Peabody here. You're just in time to accompany Sherman and me as we journey back into the year 1778. What's our destination, Mr. Peabody? Kentucky, where we'll spend one or two exciting moments with that legendary frontiersman, Daniel Boone. My Wayback Machine, ingenious invention that it is, reacted instantaneously, teleporting us to the banks of the Kentucky River, and there stood a fort which was later become known as Boonesboro. Did Daniel Boone build this fort, Mr. Peabody? It? I sure would like to meet him. Sherman's wish was granted. <whistles> Expectedly so. And you stay out of here, Daniel Boone. We don't want you. Daniel Boone? That's me. Golly, Mr. Boone, how come you were thrown out of your own fort? Don't rightly know, sonny. Used to was that folks cotton to me. Now they just can't stand me. The wind suddenly changed its direction, bringing with it a highly unsavory aroma. Wow, something smells awful. I'll say it does. Wonder what it is. That hat of yours, Daniel, how long have you had it? My coonskin cap. Just got it last Tuesday. Would that be the day your friends began taking a, a dislike to you? Now that you mention it, yeah. Say, you don't suppose it's my coonskin cap that smells? Skunk skin, Daniel. Skunk skin. We buried Boone's pungent chapeau and then talked him into an elongated session in the waters of the Kentucky River. Do you think the folks in the fort will accept Mr. Boone now? I'm certain of it, Chairman. Well, suppose we take him in his towel. We walked to the river's edge, but strangely enough, Daniel was nowhere to be seen. Well, his clothes are still on the bank, so he must be somewhere nearby. It wasn't until we examined the opposite shore that we discovered what had happened. Footprints! The tracks were easy to follow, and by late afternoon, we found where they were heading. An Indian village! Utilizing a small tree as camouflage, we were able to ferret out Daniel Boone's whereabouts. Psst! Mr. Boone, it's us! Oh, hi there, Sonny! Quick, get behind our tree and we'll help you escape. There's not an Indian anywhere near this tent. Can't do it, boy. Why not? No clothes. Them engines captured me raw. We couldn't leave him. Therefore, we had no alternative but to make our presence known to the Indian chief and try to win Daniel Boone's freedom. Let me get him straight. You challenge my best warrior to contest? That's right. I'll race him in a canoe, shoot arrows at a target, and send up smoke signals faster than he can. Mm. Sound them like Olympics. Okay, you got them, deal. Two out of three win. If Warrior loses, Boone goes free. If you lose, you get them scalped. Hmm. The first event was a canoe race. Both got them canoe. Both paddle across river. First man to reach other side is winner. On the word go. Go! We launched our canoes. Or at least the Warrior did. Well, get going, Mr. Peabody. He's halfway across already. Patient, Chairman. The tide is due to go out any moment. And it did. <laughs> Carrying me across the river in nothing flat. Peabody one up. Now you try them test number two. We were handed bows and arrows. Forty feet away atop a tree stump stood two apples, one large, one small. Having lost the first event, my opponent received the opportunity of shooting first. He not only chose to shoot at the large apple, <coughs> he hit it. My turn was next. That small apple contained a worm with a large appetite. So large that he consumed my target before I could draw a bead. Well, <laughs> guess Warrior Winham, you both tied. That's not fair. Mr. Peabody didn't even shoot. Well, that's the way Cookie crumbles. Now we have him smoke signal contest. One who send message up fastest is final winner. While the Warrior encouraged his fire, I adjourned to a nearby tent. 
and by using rocks, pieces of flint, and wood, managed to construct a somewhat makeshift typewriter. Of course, by this time, my adversary was sending puffs of smoke skyward. What are you going to do with a typewriter, Mr. Peabody? You'll see, Sherman. I connected a rubber tube from the typewriter to a small fire, and then I went to work. Without the slightest doubt, I was the winner. Indian no go home back on word. You, boy, and Boone go free. That's wonderful, isn't it, Mr. Peabody? Yes, it is. However, Daniel still couldn't make a move without clothing. Here, Sherman, give the chief this dollar and buy that shirt and pants for Daniel. For a dollar? Is that all they cost? Certainly. That's why they call them buckskin. were smuggled out of the country aboard the SS Plankton. Oh, yes, the mastermind behind this daring plan was the Grand Vizier, or Guy Vizier, as he is now known. Boy, what I wouldn't give just to hear a chorus of Kashmiri love song. During a vocal rendition of Prisoner of Love, Rocky hacks out their way to freedom. Hey, what's coming off in the reed section? Our fetters, that's what. The Grand Vizier and his soldiers gave chase, but the one place they neglected to search was a lifeboat on sea deck. I think we're safe. I think you're right. They were both wrong, for the SS Plankton was up to its plimsoll line in cargo, and something had to be tossed overboard. What'll it be? Passengers or lifeboat? Passengers! Well, we couldn't get away with it on a kid's show, so it was the lifeboat they got. The one occupied by Rocky and Bullwinkle. Uh, no thanks, Rock. I'm not thirsty. What do you mean you're not thirsty? Well, didn't you just open a canteen and spill some water? Hokey smoke, we're foundering, and we're upside down in the water. Boy, if there's one thing you've got, Rock, it's perception. It wasn't easy, but through sheer superhuman moose power, the boys managed to right their craft. Uh-oh, fog's coming in. Who cares? New York is in that direction. Row, Bowwinkle, row hard. The moose complied for all he was worth. Alas, what he didn't know was that a mooring cable had snagged the prow of the lifeboat. Therefore, no matter how hard he pulled, the boat went right along with the SS Plankton. Stroke! Stroke! I'm stroking! I'm stroking! Two weeks later, the lifeboat stopped, just as the fog and their spirits lifted. There it is, Bullwinkle, New York City! Yeah! Statue of Liberty, Empire State Building, India Inc. Company... India, India Inc. The realization that they had been towed all the way to the harbor of Bombay suddenly sank in. I think I shall now be sick. Don't waste it. Wait until you reach our remote city. And that word remote fit most aptly, for high in the Pakistan hills, nestled snugly amid giant boulders, sat the small but exceedingly remote city of Jaipur, whose very name struck terror in the hearts of peaceful men. The Pasha who ruled this tempestuous town had no mercy with those who transgressed against tribal laws. But you're merciless, one. I didn't swipe this ruby yacht. You did too. For eons and eons, it floated in this sacred shrine. Looks more like a bathtub. That's what it is. Anyways, as long as it floated, the city of Jaipur had good luck. And you mean when it was taken, you had bad luck? Twelve months of steady monsoons. That's a lot of rain, Jack. Yes, I call that bad luck. But you said the ruby yacht disappeared 400 centuries ago. You got sharp ears for a squirrel. Well, listen here, Pasha. I'll have you know I am not 400 years old. I should take your word for it. Take him out and cut off his... Uh, no, that wouldn't hurt him. Aha! Ooh, ooh! Throw him in the cobra pit. The seconds later, Bullwinkle stood swaying at the rim of a pit, while below a covey of cobras watched evilly. We will teach you the error of false pride. See, weren't you in Gunga Din? Over you go! No, no, wait a minute! Actually, we have to wait more than a minute because we've run out of time. Does Rocky have something up his sleeve? Uh, fur? We'll find out in the New Delhi Catassin or Judgment at Bloomberg's. Hang tight. Nickelodeon's Musa Rama will be right back. That Tommy, he's not like other babies. Tommy Pickles makes the girls go gaga. On Rugrats every Sunday at 10.30, 9.30 Central on Nickelodeon. 
Spirograph, Spirograph. Beautiful designs. Spirograph, Spirograph. Perfect every time. Amazing art. Watch it grow. You look like a pro. Unbelievable. Spirograph, Spirograph. The one for beautiful designs. Meet Tina and her brother Tyler. Whatever one has, the other wants. And that's the way it's always been. Now, thanks to Capri Sun Fruit Drink, Tina can have the delicious 100% natural Capri Sun Fruit Drink that she loves so much. And Tyler can collect all 22 Nickelodeon decals of his favorite Nicktoons, free inside each specially marked Capri Sun 10-pack. And since the decals are reusable and there's enough Capri Sun for both of them, they should be happy for now. Capri Sun Fruit Drink and Nickelodeon decals. You'd better grab your own before they do. This is Pop Secret Pop Quiz. I'm Plato, your Pop Quiz host. Pop Quiz pops in six different colors. The big question is, what'll pop up next? Are you ready? Kate. Three. Too bad. Mike. Purple. Sorry. Ted. Blue. You guessed it. So what do I get? You get to eat it. There's no buttery. The quizzically colorful Pop Quiz, where the big question is, what'll pop up next? Here come Cabbage Patch Splash and Pan Kids. In the pool or bath. We're making a splash. Splash and Pan Kids really tan in the sun. Wow. Making a splash with my Splash and Tan Kid. You are in the ozone. And now back to Nickelodeon's Moosarama. And now, here to tell you everything about anything is Mr. Know-It-All. Hello, knowledge thirsties. Today's subject is how to sell vacuum cleaners and clean up. Now, the two prime requisites in selling vacuums are the customer and the customee. The customer, or victim, usually lives in a house like this one. The customee, or salesman, has to get in the house. Rule number one, always get your foot in the customer's door. Good morning, customer. Would you be interested in... such door, huh? Rule number two, Find a door one can put one's foot in. Good morning, customer. Mind if I put my foot in your... Oh, 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 oh. Rule number three, forget rule number one. At this point, also forget about getting in the door and find another way of getting in, such as a window. There will be a open window. Look at mess you made. Oh, sure, customer. I shall rectify that in a jiffy. <laughs> What you doing? It's an extra feature. It not only cleans up, it dirties up. Wait a second, I shall put it in reverse and suck up everything in sight. Oh, you wasn't kidding. You picked up the whole room. Congratulations, you begged the customer. Not to mention the customee. Well, you're just in time for what might be a very unhappy ending. In our preceding installment, Rocky and Bullwinkle assumed they were rowing back to New York, only to discover that they had been towed all the way to Bombay. The Grand Vizier escorted our heroes to the hard-to-find city of Jaipur. Uh, one of the few times in this story we haven't come up with a bad pun. Moose, squirrel, meet his highness Nas the Pasha. I do not wish to offend either of you offendees, but would you mind divulging which one of you pilfered the ruby yacht? Oh, yes, the little ship that had been stolen from that sacred bathtub 400 centuries ago. And ever since, we've had a plethora of ill fortune. Plethora? A whole bunch. Now, who took the yacht? I took it, but it isn't my yacht. I mean, it is my yacht, but I took it. That is, I know, marshmallows. There were two ways of dying in Jaipur. Just living there and being cast into the dreaded cobra pit. This was to be Bullwinkle's punishment. Shame it isn't the end of an episode. We could use Fangs for the Memory as a title. <laughs> Never mind the shop talk. Walk over into the pit. Look, if I have to go this way, those snakes can walk over to me. Silence, thief of thieves. Push him in. Stop! Stop! What do you mean, stop? You can't say stop when we're about to push Moose over. What is wrong with you? I said stop, and I mean stop. He said stop. How about that? Well, no one had ever said that before, so they all adjourned to the throne room, leaving the snake pit behind. Goodbye, Olivia. 
Now, what gives with all this stop jazz? Your eminence! Your majesty! Skip the flattery. We all know I'm great. We demand a fair trial! You're kidding! We don't have fair trials here. We don't have any trials. Rocky threatened to shout more stops, so a trial was agreed upon. Counselor for the accused, Rocket J. Squirrel! What'll we do, Perry? Plead self-defense? First off, you throw a fit! But, Bullwinkle, this was easy. <laughs> While this was going on, Rocky, unnoticed, grabbed a sheet of paper, shaped it into an unreasonable facsimile of the ruby yacht, and sprayed some lacquer on it. Amazing set of coincidences, isn't it? You can quit now, Bullwinkle. Ooh, uh, uh, I'm all cured. Mr. Pasha, my client did not steal your ruby yacht. In fact, nobody did. I object. That's in the material and an elephant. Overruled! You see, the real ruby yacht was here all the time in the bottom of the sacred bathtub. With that maneuvering that only a flying squirrel could do, Rocky brought up the yacht. You mean it sank 400 years ago? Exactly! Okay, Doc, wise guy, what is ruby yacht moose bad? This one, nothing but paper. Days later, aboard the SS Plankton's return voyage... That dude was quick figuring, Doc, manufacturing a dummy yacht and planting the real one in the tub. But I still don't know how you did it. Look, Bullwinkle, just do me a favor. Don't enter any more boat races. Oh, never fear. Next year, it's the marble shootout. I won't even come close to winning. Why do you say that? Well, look at my marble. It's all oblongish and not the least bit round, and it's got the word hope on it. Hokey smokes! That might be the Hope Diamond. Well, at least it won't be hopeless then, eh, Rock? <laughs> Rock? Rocket J? Oh, Rock! fast. The only way to keep up is to get your butt on the couch and snick this Saturday on Nickelodeon. Square root of the inverse... Who sent in the postcard? Who sent in the 